Uh, good afternoon and welcome to today's DAA Astronomy Seminar. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, Dr. Pujan Agarwal. Um, as you all know, one of the major frontiers of astrophysics research is to understand how massive stars evolve and form compact objects. And Pujan's work is directly relevant uh, to that question. And he ha she has significantly contributed to our latest understanding on this topic. Uh, she is the lead developer of a stellar evolution code called Matisse. Uh, Pujan did her PhD at the Swinburne University of Technology under the guidance of Professor Jared Hurley last year. And now she is a postdoctoral research associate at the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in addition to her research, uh, Pujan is also highly interested in outreach activities and science communication. Um, let's welcome Pujan. Uh, Pujan, it's up, uh, back to you. Please start. Thank you, Saurabh. That was a really beautiful introduction. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, uh, my name is Pujan, and today I will be giving you some insights about massive stars and star cluster simulations. Uh, initial, uh, let's, um, so, sorry. Uh, have a look at uh, what's in today's talk. So in the, I'll start by talking about star cluster simulations. In particular, why do we need to include models of massive stars? Uh, then I will talk about massive stars themselves. So how do we model their life and what are some of the challenges? And finally, I will talk about how we can combine these two. All right, so let's start with a little bit of history of star cluster simulations and when uh, stellar evolution became important there. So honestly, in the un up until early 20th century, uh, star clusters were considered to be simple static systems of stars. So the uh, stellar evolution or even stars didn't have any particular role to play. But in the mid 20th century, it was realized that no, these these stars are not static, but they are interacting dynamically with each other. And uh, so um, we need to take into account those gravitational or those dynamical interactions between these member stars in a cluster. And, but even then, uh, stars were treated as point particles. So they were not evolving system. They were still static uh, um, in terms of evolution. And finally, it was not until late uh, 20th century, uh, it was realized that, okay, um, with all these dynamical interaction, we can get observations of star clusters, but to match them with observation, we need to take into account the stellar properties. So luminosity, radius, and things like that. And simple prescriptions were developed to take into account uh, such things. For example, uh, mass loss as the star would uh, become a white dwarf or undergo a supernovae. Right, um, and then, um, so all this was fine, but then again, we needed uh, to reproduce objects such as blue stragglers and millisecond pulsars that we see in all these different cluster systems. And just having simple stellar properties wasn't enough. So finally, a rapid code was developed where stellar properties could be defined as a function of stars, metallicity, mass, and age. All this was great. and. This code is still in use now, and I will talk about it later in my talk, but we are in year 2022, so 20 years uh, since that happened. And we have now quite many ground and space-based telescope, which are providing us with high resolution data of both massive stars, star clusters, and all different things in cosmos. And with all these different um, observing capabilities, we can now see finer details in different stellar systems. There have been many progress from the observation side, uh, but I think I'd like to point out two important things that we need to consider uh, in terms of star cluster simulations is the discovery of uh, gravitational wave from binary mergers of neutron stars and black holes. So both these are remnants of massive stars. Um, the discovery ignited many questions 
including how, uh, and I think some of the uh, most first and foremost one that how do these compact binaries form and what conditions lead to their merger? What are the environments in which they form? So are they form in dynamical environment in a star cluster or do they form as isolated binaries in a field star? So all these different questions uh, now lead us to think that, okay, we should include massive models of massive stars. Uh, the other more important thing that happened was the discovery of multiple stellar populations in global Earth clusters. So for those who don't know, for a very long time, it was assumed that um, global Earth clusters are uh, formed out of single star burst and all the stars uh, there have same metallicity, same chemical composition and evolve coevally. But then um, uh, space-based uh, telescopes like Hubble in um, around 2007 and so on, uh, the photometric and spectrometric data from uh, these telescopes started giving us clues that no, this is not true. We do see some uh, stars where there are certain chemical correlations and anti-correlations. Uh, so far, we don't exactly know how these uh, correlations arise, but we do know one thing that these uh, correlations exist um, are, uh, or these chemical anomalies are indicative of high temperature hydrogen burning, which amongst other things happens in massive stars. So overall, uh, we need to explore early evolution of uh, globular clusters or in general star clusters where these massive stars would have been forming with up-to-date models of massive stars. I've been talking or using the term massive stars a lot, but let's define it here first. So, the very uh, uh, proper definition uh, for massive stars would be stars that are massive enough to undergo core collapse at the end of their life. They are called massive stars. Um, there is no particular mass value I can assign to these uh, stars because it changes with different factors such as chemical composition of the star rotation and so on. Uh, but in general, I think it would be safe to say that stars which are more massive than nine solar masses at the time of birth at solar metallicity, they are considered massive stars. Now, the best way to model these stars would be using three-dimensional uh, stellar structure and evolution codes, um, but it's computationally very expensive, but uh, so we cannot use to model complete evolution of stars. So what we do, we instead use 1D stellar evolution codes where, where we use only radius or even more mass as the special coordinate. Now let's have a look at how these um, codes work. So 1D stellar evolution codes, they solve these equations of stellar structures, which you must all be familiar from your stellar 101 course. They solve these equations, uh, differential equations for um, a given model. So different points inside a star and then evolve it with time and finally get a complete uh, track for a star. So if I uh, have to see it in action, and if you take two quantities, so luminosity and temperature of the star, I can actually show complete evolutionary history of a 15 solar mass star here. So this is where the star is undergoing core, um, hydrogen burning, as, uh, finally uh, going to helium burning, uh, crosses husband gap, and finally ends its life as a rest supergiant. So this is uh, for a 15 solar mass star. We can repeat this exercise for stars of different initial masses. And this is what we get. Uh, so again, in the uh, luminosity and temperature uh, space, we can plot all these different uh, tracks of stars of different initial masses. And you can clearly see that the evolutionary track of a one solar mass star is quite different from that of a five or 10 solar mass star. And again, quite different to a hundred solar mass star. Right. So we have um, 1D stellar evolution code. We have our star cluster simulations. Uh, Pujan, there is a question. Yes. Hey, uh, thanks for noticing. Yeah. So I have a question regarding the wind model you consider. So when you are taking the evolution, uh, how do you put the wind model in these scenarios? I will uh, come to that in a moment. So okay, good. Uh, thanks. yeah, I will, uh, I will answer your question, I think, uh, throughout uh, this talk. Uh, awesome. But if not, uh, we can come back to this question towards the end. Thank you. Okay. Right. So we have 1D simulations, we have star cluster simulations, 
why not we just go together and put them like we have all the materials we need right but then uh, integrating evolution of star in star cluster simulation actually comes with certain requirements because these star cluster simulations by uh, themselves are computationally very expensive and time consuming the underlying stellar evolution code we should use should be computationally inexpensive we do not want to add any overhead to our already very um, big and massive uh, star cluster simulations it should be fast and most importantly it should be robust so it should be able to not break down at times and require user intervention to push forward the evolution and when we judge 1d stellar evolution codes on these three criteria seems like they fail in all three aspects they are computationally very expensive so it requires minutes to hours uh, depending on uh, what physical ingredients you put um, in the code um, to ev compute evolution of just single star. These are time consuming, as I said, it takes uh, hours and they're definitely not robust. So this is something I'll again come back uh, to, uh, I'll show later in my talk, but uh, for now we cannot use 1D codes directly, but all is not lost because we cannot use them directly, but we can calculate uh, models of different uh, st stars of different masses. And then what we can do, we can define fitting formulae. So the different components of uh, these tracks. And then every time we have pre evolved stars, we can use this fitting formulae and compute evolution of stars of different masses and metallicity. This exact thing was done, uh, have been done by any people, but the most notable one would be the single star evolution or SSC fitting formulae developed by Harley et al. These co uh, fitting formulae are very popular and are used in a range of star cluster and binary population synthesis code. Uh, some quick insights about uh, this code and the stellar tracks that were used in computing these formulae. So these tracks are based on the polynomial fits to stellar tracks that were computed by Paul Sitol in year 1998 using STARS a stellar revolution code. Um, initially, uh, the tracks only exist for 0.1 to 50 solar masses, although these fitting formulae, uh, they do get used to stars of up to 100, even 1000 solar masses. And the metallicity range is some uh, very less uh, uh, low metallicity, so 10 by minus four to uh, super solar metallicities. And another uh, quick point in calculating uh, these tracks, it was assumed that no mass is lost through stellar winds. So all these tracks had constant mass and any kind of mass loss or in the form of winds or by the interaction would, uh, was defined within these formula itself. Now, uh, and if we go back and again, just these fitting formulae on the criteria, whether we can put it in our star cluster simulation. Well, uh, fitting formulae pass these criteria with uh, flying colors. They are computationally inexpensive, fast. So you can compute evolution of hundreds to thousands of stars in just under a second. Compare that to uh, computing evolution of single star uh, uh, that will take hours in a 1D code. And most importantly, these formulae are robust. And just uh, to quickly highlight, when I said that uh, rapid codes were developed in year 2000, I was actually talking about codes like SSC. But again, we are not in year 2000, we are in year 2022, and we have all these amazing observatories and all the amazing observation coming in. And now in response to that, we need to include up-to-date models of massive stars in our simulations. Um, so next, let's a little bit talk about so what are the challenges in modeling massive stars? Remember this um, set of equations I showed you earlier? Well, this is incomplete because these equations also need input from a various uh, variety of other sources. So for example, you need to define equation of state, you need to provide table for opacities, uh, you need to also have a model for uh, mass loss rates and so on. And all these different physical inputs, we know them quite well, for low mass stars and intermediate mass stars, but these are very uncertain for massive stars and contribute to what we call physical uncertainties in massive stellar evolution. But these are just one side of picture. We also have 
numerical factors, so numerical uncertainty, such as temporal and spatial evolution of the star. So just by changing these things, your um, uh, evolution of star or the model you're getting can change or the order in which you're solving the stellar structure equations simultaneously versus non simultaneously, all these different things can contribute to, um, again, variation in the models that we will get for massive stars. And while physical uncertainties have been co talked quite a lot about in the past, and uh, there's a lot of work on that, numerical factors are very rarely discussed, but the fact is both physical um, and numerical uncertainties equally affect the lives of massive stars. <clears throat> now, next, let's look at some of the uh, massive star models that are already available and see how uh, do they compare with each other? What's the impact of these uncertainties? So let's take models, um, non-rotating stellar models at near solar metallicity. So I'm defining my solar as 0.014. Uh, let's take models from uh, BPAS, from the Bond code, from the Geneva code, <clears throat> from MESA, and also from PASEC code. So, uh, and let's first look at the property. I think most of us will find quite interesting, uh, the properties of gravitational wave progenitors. So um, for this, I'll be uh, plotting the initial uh, mass of the star against the remnant mass. And this remnant mass have cal is calculated using Bijinsky et al. Uh, prescription, where it is stated as a function of final total mass of the star and final uh, core mass of the star. And we do, when we do this, we actually see something like this. Now, we did expect to see some variation in the remnant mass. So this is on the y-axis here. We did see, uh, expected that there will be some variation, but the, the variation um, in uh, the prediction of remnant mass actually can be quite high when you consider mass of star models, especially above 40 solar masses. It can be as high as 10 to 20 solar masses. Now, if we uh, zoom in a little bit on this side, we can see that, well, we do, uh, the models uh, <clears throat> do predict a comparable remnant mass for stars up to 20, 30 solar masses, but the divergence actually starts happening beyond 30 solar mass. So it seems like there's something happening over here that is <clears throat> uh, causing all these uh, additional differences. Um, before I go and explain that, let's have a look at another property. And this is the maximum radial expansion of the star. <clears throat> so the maximum um, radii that the star would achieve during its lifetime, that I have plotted here on y-axis, and again, against the initial mass of the star. And here again, you can see that um, for again, 20, 30 solar masses, um, most of the stellar models predict quite similar values but the divergence becomes quite a lot as you start going beyond this initial mass. So again, you can get order of magnitudes uh, difference in this prediction of stellar radii. And this is quite important when we are um, looking at binary evolution because even a difference of one solar radii can matter a lot when you're evolving a binary system of star and trying to determine how they will interact. <clears throat> so it seems like something is happening. Uh, I'm sorry. Um... Can I, uh, what, what do you mean by the radial expansion? It's essentially when you put a, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I, that, I, I, you know. Okay, Let, um, so when I say maximum radial expansion, it is the maximum radius star will achieve in its lifetime. So this is where, for example, it starts uh, with a radius something over here. Mm -hmm. So this is the zero H main sequence radius. Then as the star evolves, becomes um, a giant star, it would uh, expand. So its radius will become more. And then finally, at some point, if it will either end its life there, or it if it's losing a lot of mass, it would go and become a naked helium star or will start going towards higher temperature, lower radius uh, bounds. So the maximum you will get throughout um, would be here. So this will be mostly the super giant radius uh, for most of these stars except for these massive stars, because these um, become naked helium stars. So this will be somewhere like during their main sequence, they will achieve this maximum radii. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, so, but, so that depends on, so 
all these chords need not have similar, uh, you know, uh, physical inputs, right? Is that the reason for this, or these are purely uh, numerical treatment that creates this? Yeah, so that's the thing I'm, uh, I'm talking next. Uh, definitely, there are uh, differences in the physical inputs that are uh, used in computing these models. So that, that is one driving factor. But there are also, um, uh, so that's my next slide. Uh, when we look at stars more than 30 solar masses, and you see that the difference in properties becomes a lot. So it seems like there's something else which is contributing to these differences apart from all the physical inputs we have used. And these are the numerical issues that arise in the envelopes of massive stars, which are more massive than 30 solar masses at this metallicity. So uh, what happens that as a star becomes, um, so sorry, before I go on, uh, does that uh, clarify uh, the question? Yeah, please okay. go ahead. Right. So as uh, massive stars, they, um, <clears throat> they, as they become super giants, well, uh, they develop this highly dense core but very low density envelope. So the density I'm talking about uh, here would be the order of 10th power minus 10 gram per centimeter cube. Now, these low density envelopes have low gas pressure and also because of low density, convection um, there is inefficient. So it would happen in some thin layers uh, in the envelope, but it won't be efficient at transporting energy. Now, the other thing that happens in these massive stars, again, more than 30 solar masses, is that these stars are able to reach Eddington limit in their envelope. What does this mean? So just to recall, Eddington limit is uh, the balance between gravity and radiation. So the, um, if the luminosity of star exceeds this limit, um, it will expand due to radiation and so on. And so when I say adding the limit is exceeded, what happens is the radiative luminosity or the luminosity that can be uh, transported through radiation, that uh, becomes greater than L Eddington or Eddington luminosity. Now, when this happens in stars, it leads to situation what we call as density and gas pressure inversion. So where density, where instead of monotonically decreases, dec decreasing in the outer layer of stars, it, it increases at this point uh, where this limit is exceeded. Now, by themselves, these uh, density and gas pressure inversions are harmless. They do not affect the model, but when combined with these inversions and low gas pressure, we can uh, get numerical issues for 1D stellar evolution code. And this happens for pretty much every uh, stellar evolution code out there. Um, <clears throat> So, and so far, we do not know how, uh, how to treat this, whether it's just a numerical artifact or does this actually happens in nature and stars overcome these inversions uh, by certain method. But when we encounter a situation- Everyone, we, um, uh, sorry. Everyone, if you are not the speaker, can you please mute yourself? Thank you, Saurabh. Um, right. So we get these numerical issues where the time step of uh, computation become really small and our models essentially get stuck during the evolution. Now, as I said, there is uh, no proper way around this problem uh, because still don't know how to, uh, what physical aspects it can have. It's an area of open research. Meanwhile, uh, different stellar evolution codes or programmers, they employ what we call pragmatic solutions to get, get around the problem. So we're not solving it. We just try to avoid uh, the situation where we get um, stuck with small time steps. So um, the best uh, form of solution would be removing this top more, topmost layers where you get these inefficient convection or where these uh, density inversions are arising. So that is by enhancing mass loss rate. Or secondly, enhancing the efficiency of convection. So making convection uh, more efficient. And this can be again done in various manner, but two commonly used methods would be uh, by uh, enhancing the value of mixing lens parameter or by suppressing density inversion. So that uh, can be done by boosting temperature gradient. Now, we know that all uh, these are different solutions, but do they really affect the evolution of massive stars and how much do they contribute? So 
um, so the uh, different uh, stellar models I showed you earlier, how much is the contribution of these uncertainties in those uh, models? <clears throat> to understand this, I computed models of uh, massive stars. So stars in the mass range of 10 to 110 solar masses with MISA. And I computed it for slightly lower metallicity. So this is one tenth of solar metallicity. And I was trying to compute evolution until carbon has depleted in the core. So star would undergo hydrogen burning, then helium burning, and finally carbon burning. So the end of carbon burning would be the stopping condition. Now, as you can see in this HR diagram, I've shown uh, what I got. Um, so if I do not use any pragmatic solution, this is what I get. So stars of uh, range 10 to 20 and 20 solar masses, uh, sorry, stars with initial mass 10, 20 solar masses, they evolve um, through these blue crosses, which is the end of uh, core hydrogen burning and also through core helium burning. So this is indicated by these set crosses. So they're able to complete evolution all the way until carbon depletion in the core. But for more massive stars, for stars in the uh, above 30 solar masses, you see this, um, these stars are not even able to complete um, core uh, helium burning. So they are uh, getting stuck in their evolution. So um, the colors over here, they indicate the maximum value of L rad by L Eddington throughout the star. So if anywhere inside the star, uh, uh, we, we compute all these um, value of this factor for different layers, and the maximum of that is indicated here. So if the star is in this green zone, so everywhere you see this green zone, is it the safe zone? We do not get, uh, it, it simply means that uh, radiative luminosity is less than Eddington luminosity. And all these models, they evolve, they do not have any problem during the evolution. But as a star evolves, um, it can actually <clears throat> exceed uh, this Eddington limit and it can, actually be exceeded by a factor of up to eight and even more than that in very massive stars. To understand that why uh, these two models evolved uh, through these density inversions, but others didn't, let's plot, make another plot. And this time, so this is the same HR diagram, but this time I'm plotting the minimum value of gas pressure fraction, so P gas by uh, total pressure. And you can see that for these two stars, the value of P gas is uh, more than 50% throughout the life of star. But for these very massive stars, uh, especially towards the point where their evolution is getting stuck, so all these points, the value of gas pressure fraction has fallen to less than 3% of total um, uh, gas pressure. So it's very low. So I can see that um, the com and the combination of these two is resulting in very small time step and I cannot compute a compute complete evolution of star here. So now what I did, I started employing the different solution, pragmatic solution and see if I can compute uh, complete tracks. So the first method I employed was definitely enhancing the mass loss. So um, what I did now, again, uh, one can ask the question here that all these models, they already had mass loss. So why don't they get rid of these outer layers by themselves? Um, so uh, the answer to that would be that in order to get rid of this density inversion, your mass loss rate should be high enough for convection to, to not allow convection to set in these outer layers. So in very technical term, it should be more that your mass loss rate should be higher than the convective turnover time scale. So I tried with different uh, mass loss enhancements um, to uh, the original mass loss and see if I can get a complete set of models. Well, I did. Uh, so whenever uh, I enhance mass loss to eight times its original value, whenever stellar luminosity would exceed Eddington luminosity inside the star, I was able to get complete set of stellar models. And you can see that the, both these blue crosses and the red crosses are also present, indicating that we get to the end of complete helium burning. And I haven't indicated it here, but all these models also underwent through uh, carbon burning. So that's one method. Uh, other method would be uh, enhancing internal mixing. So mixing efficient, uh, convective efficiency is directly proportional to mixing length um, in, in these stars. And uh, so to increase mixing length, um, I actually increase the mixing length parameter. So in the original set of models I've shown, 
it was calibrated to observation alpha MLD and it had a value of 1.82. So, uh, so I started evolving models with higher value of MLD and for three times the original value, I can get complete set of models. And finally, third way, which is the MLT++ method of MISA. Uh, that's the way of suppressing density inversion. Now, what happens that um, in these um, uh, low density envelopes of massive stars where we have convection happening, uh, the mass, different mass elements that are transporting energy, they are uh, carrying energy, but because uh, the um, uh, for efficient convection, they should be transporting energy adiabatically. So they shouldn't be losing energy to their surrounding. But because of high difference in the actual temperature gradient and the adiabatic uh, temperature gradient, these uh, mass elements are losing energy as they move uh, in the star. As, and by the time they reach um, the end of convection, they have actually transported very little energy. So convection is not efficient there. So if we artificially change uh, the values of these temperature gradients, so if we change a reduced temperature gradient to make it equivalent to adiabatic temperature gradient, convection will be more efficient. And that's what exactly is, happens in the MLT++ method of MISA. You just are changing the, uh, the temperature gradient to make it closer to adiabatic temperature gradient. The convection becomes efficient and your models again evolve uh, throughout the end of core helium burning. Now, I talked about all these different methods, but let's see uh, what's the impact on the evolution of stars. So going back to, again, uh, plotting the remnant mass of the star with its initial mass. And you can clearly see that, um, that uh, for, again, models, uh, these more than 50, 60 solar masses, there is a difference of almost 10 solar mass between the different methods. And although these two models, um, uh, models with extra mixing, and MLT++, they do um, predict very similar value here. One thing I would like to highlight that with both MLT++ and mixing, extra mixing, I made use of models um, that required me to enhance these values, the, the minimum values for which I was able to get complete set of models. But in general, uh, different stellar evolution codes do not uh, do these tests, they just use these very high values, let their models evolve. So these, these um, differences can be quite different there. Anyway, um, in terms of remnant mass, they do not seem to have too much difference, but models with extra mass loss definitely show uh, quite different uh, remnant masses. But if I look at the radial expansion of the star, again, um, so this is something I found in general that uh, the radius of star is very sensitive to both uh, numerical parameters and physical parameters with the inputs. And here you can see there's a clear difference in the, uh, the radius prediction, what we get from these different methods. So this is in log scale. So even here, it doesn't look a lot, but it's a difference of hundreds of solar radii between the different stellar models. So um, in the nutshell, I think I can we can conclude that uh, just like physical uncertainties, numerical uncertainties can also have significant effect on the lives of massive stars and actually in the order, uh, same order as physical uncertainties. So we should take into account uh, <clears throat> uh, the, these uh, uncertainties as well. And to do that, we should uh, test different uh, stellar models and uh, computed with different physical and numerical inputs. So now um, if we go back and look at the requirements that we have from our stellar evolution code in today's state, um, the requirements actually change slightly. And I think the new requirement would be, again, like computationally inexpensive, fast and robust, but now the stellar evolution code should also be able to make use of different sets of stellar models. Now, if we come go back and compare fitting formulae to this new requirement, it seems like these formulae are not adaptable to changes and they're also very difficult to calculate. So every time you need to change the stellar tracks, you will have to change these, define these fitting formulae again, and which is not an easy task. So it seems like our, this connection between stellar evolution codes and star cluster simulation is a little bit broken. And this is where my works uh, come in. So Matisse, which stands, Yes. Uh, there is a question before you move on to the next part. 
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, if you please go to your uh, previous slide where you are showing the evolution, I have mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions there. One is uh, how your results will change if you change the uh, intrinsic stellar metallicity of the parent star. So you have shown something like 0.1 of solar mass, solar metallicity. Sorry. Mm -hmm. If you take a different value, how these results will change? Okay, so I think uh, in order, okay, I haven't done the calculations for all different metallicities, but one thing I can say, so <clears throat> these numerical issues, they um, occur more in high mass star at higher metallicity. So one thing I didn't really discuss is why these, uh, why <clears throat> Uh, you will get these density inversions is because when the star evolves and the temperature in its outer layer changes, um, <clears throat> it changes the ionizing state of different elements that are present. And you get these uh, different changes in opacity as well. So you get these different opacity bumps. So the three uh, important opacity bumps for these massive stars are the one due to ionization of iron, due to ionization state of helium, and one due to recombination of hydrogen. So, um, and these opacity bumps, they change uh, with metallicity. So they de depend on pressure density and metallicity, chemical composition as well. So for lower uh, values of metallicity, in fact, you do not encounter any of these troubles for stars up to 80, 90 solar masses. So you can compute their evolution uh, mm -hmm. without any difficulty. So there, there won't be any need of these methods. So then you will be able to compute models uh, more um, with more certainty, but it's mostly for uh, massive stars at high metallicity, you get these differences. Um, so I can't exactly answer your question because I haven't done this calculation for uh, stars at different metallicity, um, but I'm oh, expecting that these differences would be higher for stars, uh, for, uh, uh, stars at solar metallicity and would be lower as you go towards lower metallicity. No, no, this is already useful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so let's jump to Matisse now. Now, again, in Matisse, you make use of uh, stellar tracks that you have computed with 1D stellar revolution code, but instead of defining fitting formulae, you interpolate between the tracks and compute evolution of track at the instant. Now, the advantage of this method, there are many, um, or also, um, I won't go into details here, but um, Matisse uses this equivalent evolutionary phase-based approach to uh, interpolate between the tracks. And it can compute evolution of uh, stellar parameters from zero H main sequence to the respective remnant phase of the star. So this is when the star would become black hole, neutron star, white dwarf, et cetera. And it has been specially developed uh, to, uh, to serve as an alternative to SSC fitting formulae. So any code that currently uses SSC to evolve single star should be very easily able to uh, switch to Matisse. And because of interpolation, it gives um, another advantage that we can make use of different st sets of stellar models um, uh, in very easily in our code. So if uh, all you have to do is just change the name of uh, input uh, track. So you just have to change a certain file name. And that's it, you can compute evolution of um, different um, uh, different kind of stars computed with different physical parameters, with different numerical parameters, even from different 1D stellar evolution codes. Now, um, let's compare. Um, and when, we, when you give um, a T-set property, it can, um, uh, for example, use the original Paul Settle 1998 tracks, which were used in computing SSC fitting formulae. And we can do that and compare METIS with SSC. Uh, one quick note that this is for solar metallicity. And because original post tracks were computed without any mass loss, I'm again showing these tracks assuming no mass loss of any kind. So I think expect that uh, Matisse and SSE, so the Matisse is in solid line here and SSE is in dashed line. They co show quite similar behavior. But as you can see for this 10 solar mass star, there are certain small features in the tracks that Matisse is able to capture pretty well, which is something SSE is just approximating through a straight line. And these small details in the tracks, they can actually make quite an impact. And we, uh, 
and we can uh, talk uh, see this thing uh, shortly. So overall, they agree pretty well. And this is just for Paul stack, but as I said, we can very easily switch to other models. So uh, just as an example, these uh, tracks on the left are tracks. The, the solid lines are the detailed tracks or the 1D um, stellar evolution models computed with MISA. And these dashed lines show tracks that are interpolated by Metis. And similarly, um, I have tracks from the bond code, again shown in solid lines here on the right side, and uh, tracks that are interpolated by Metis in dashed line. And you can clearly see that Metis does a pretty good job at interpolation. <clears throat> so I think I can safely say that this bridge that was broken between um, stellar evolution code and star cluster simulation um, due to all these new requirements has now been fixed. Now, all that sounds good, but this is just for single stars, but we know that we also have binary and triple systems of stars. And in fact, most massive stars, they occur as these multiple systems. They do not occur in isolation. So what about those? To do that, we actually in incorporated METIS with uh, binary stellar evolution code BSE, which was again developed by Chad Hurley in 2002. Um, BSE um, so far has used SSC to compute evolution or to supply evolution para parameters of uh, the individual stars uh, in the system. And as I said, that METIS has been specially designed to serve as an alternative to SSC. We were able to replace SSC with METIS and uh, use it in the binary code. Um, but in a binary star, you also have a mass transfer in, in interaction um, between these uh, different components. So you need to, again, take into account the effect of these, this extra mass loss or gain. And that's why we incorporated these effects in METIS and used it with BSC. And in the next few examples that I will show you, I'll be actually um, um, evolving a sister of, system of um, two stars with initial masses 25 and 15 solar masses. Again, metallicity almost solar. These stars, they start out in a circular orbit. So eccentricity is zero. And with the initial orbital period of 1800 days, which is something like 2000 solar radii. So we use METIS with a uh, post at all 1998 tracks and computer evolution of uh, this binary system with METIS and also with SSC. So let's first see what we get from SSC or what we have historically been getting from SSC. So <clears throat> you have the two stars evolving uh, from main sequence. Uh, this primary evolves, fills, fills its Roche lobe during core helium burning and starts transferring material to secondary. It does so until it explodes as a supernova almost uh, a mega year later. And in the process, it has transferred almost five solar mass worth of material to the secondary <clears throat> and forming a nine solar mass black hole in the end. Now the secondary evolves and lifts its, lifts its life, explodes as a supernova and becomes a neutron star in the end. However, um, the high uh, uh, mass it has, it gives also gets a higher kick and in the end, the system is disrupted. Now, if I compute the evolution of the same system using METIS this time, we get slightly different uh, evolution. So again, the steps that we encounter uh, during uh, the evolution of this binary, they are same, but there's a small difference is for how long does this mass transfer last? So compared to SSC, where this mass transfer kind of lasted for one mega year, here it lasts for just a few hundred thousand years. And it, um, in METIS, this uh, primary is not transferring much mass to secondary. So it explodes, uh, it starts mass transfer very late. So it has, when it has already finished um, core helium burning and transfers only 0.02 solar mass or something before it explodes as supernova. As a result, your secondary remains less massive throughout and forms a less massive uh, black hole. Also gets less kick. And in the end, the system remains bound, although with very high eccentricity. So this is uh, just um, with Paul's track, but Paul's track were computed in 1998. They are very old. So let, what about uh, we use MISA tracks now? So again, let's use METIS and use MISA tracks. 
Uh, now these tracks, I've computed them with different uh, physical parameters. So there's a lot many physical quantities that are different, but what we're evolving is same. We again have this 25 and 15 um, solar mass uh, system of binary. And here, Rosho overflow starts during husband gap itself. And um, star continues to transfer mass. And by the time it reaches this core helium burning phase, it it forms a common envelope around both stars, and you eventually end up with a 33 solar mass Mars star. Now, <clears throat> in um, as I said, like I've computed many, uh, changed many parameters in computing these MESA tracks, but one uh, particular uh, value I used that was a uh, step overshooting value. I used the value of 0.033, consistent with protitol uh, models of massive stars. So let's see uh, what happens if I change one of these physical parameters. So this is, I uh, will be changing overshooting. And again, for those who don't know, uh, overshooting um, is quite important in the determining um, the core properties of star. So it determines the size or mass of the convective core. It determines the energy output. So, sorry, I uh, overshooting here means that how much convective core core overshoots into non-convective regions or radiative regions. So if you have large value of overshooting, you will have more fuel that will be getting mixed um, to the core. So you will have more energy output, more massive core and uh, <clears throat> shorter lifetime. So this is the effect of overshooting. So what about uh, I use a slightly higher value of overshooting and use those models to compute, compute evolu evolution of this binary? So when I do that, um, if I use uh, alpha overshoot of 0.55, you can see that again, I get a very similar system, but um, unlike uh, the previous case where by the time common envelope happened, both these stars had roughly equal in mass. Here, uh, these masses are slightly different. So primary is able to transfer more mass to the secondary, but in the end, it doesn't matter because they undergo, undergo common envelope and finally a merger. So we can say that, okay, increasing overshooting didn't have much effect, but what about if I decrease this value of overshooting? Now, you actually get a very uh, funny system of star here. And um, yeah, so let's see what happens. So if I reduce the value of overshooting, um, Roche law overflow doesn't start in the main sequence. It starts again during core helium burning phase and it, uh, the star undergoes common envelope phase, but instead of merger, you instead end up with a naked helium star and the same, uh, um, and the secondary remains pretty much unaffected. Now this naked helium star, it undergoes supernova and forms a very less massive, so just a five solar mass black hole. And now secondary evolves, now uh, it evolves Felsish Roche lobe and it starts transferring mass to black hole, although not much. This one undergoes a common envelope and again forms a naked helium star. And finally, ends its life as just a 1.36 solar mass neutron star. So it's a very similar system to what we uh, got with SSC models or what we got using METIS with Paul's model, but with a very important difference. We started with a 25 and 15 solar mass um, system at almost 2000 solar ADI. But by the end of this evolution, you end up with a very compact system of neutron star, neutron star and black hole with the orbital separation of less than 100 solar ADI. And such systems can later uh, um, can give rise to gravitational waves. So yeah, you uh, get a very different system uh, when you change these different parameters. So I think the main takeaway point is that all in all these different cases, whatever's changing was just this uh, input stellar models. I didn't change anything in terms of binary evolution. I did not change parameters of my binary, but just by changing the input tracks, you can get this wide variety in the final output that you will get. And this is just for one system, but what about if we have a population of binaries or where we have, of if we have star cluster evolution, where you can get things like hierarchical mergers and you can form very massive black holes in fact. 
So this is something a work in progress and I might have to come back in a year or two or uh, something like that in that time where you can talk about uh, it later. But you can, I think I have been able to successfully convince you that evolution of massive stars has many uncertainties and these uncertainties, both physical and numerical, they can affect the evolutionary outcome. So the properties that you will get from these massive stars. And due to this, we need to test these different models um, within our simulation. And METIS is the tool exactly designed for that purpose. So we are currently uh, testing more um, binary evolution physics with it and different uh, uh, models, uh, um, different uh, binary star systems. But uh, after this, I will be testing it also in star cluster simulations to see how it can affect their properties. With this, I'll end my talk and take any more questions. Let's thank Pooja. Okay. Anindo has a question. Go ahead, Anindo. Hello. I'm audible. Yes. So in uh, slide 44 and 45. So... Slide 44 and 45. Okay. Uh -oh. Here, uh, here. Uh, yes. So, uh, what are the initial orbital period or semi major axis of this system? And they have gone through the common envelope. Uh, can you speak slightly louder? I actually can't hear you very well. Yes. Hello. Can yeah. You hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you now. Yeah. So, in these uh, systems, what are the initial orbital period at the semi major axis? And this system has gone through twice the common envelope phase. So, there will be some huge decrease in semi major axis. So, is this also incorporated in METIS? No, so this is just coming from binary evolution. So, um, as I said, like uh, when I was evolving this binary, I gave them uh, like the initial parameters for binary was same in all these different systems I showed you. Um, it was just how the, the difference in the stellar radii in the core properties. So because of difference in stellar radii, Roche lobe overflow will start at different phase, right? I mean, because initially I'm starting with same separation, almost 2000 solar radii. But as a star evolves, the differences in radius will uh, lead to difference in when this Roche lobe overflow is started, how long will it uh, last, whether or not star will en envelop, uh, enter a common envelope phase. And here its core properties will become important. So if there's a very massive core, it will lead to merger, but if the core is not so massive, you can um, instead just, uh, uh, it will result in successful ejection of this envelope. They will end up with a naked helium star. So that is, I think, the main uh, cause of difference between the models that I've shown you. Okay. Oh, so in the part of when they will eject the envelope, so there will be a decrease in gravitational energy also. Will they come closer? Yes, that, that, that's exactly what is happening. So um, I haven't listed the separation at each of the space, but throughout this evolution, so, um, okay, not that's not exactly true. Uh, throughout this part of evolution, while uh, these stars are still undergoing nuclear burning, they, uh, and also after Roche overflow starts, they are actually coming closer. That's why you get this common envelope as well. And uh, so until this point, uh, you're, uh, <clears throat> The separation is uh, decreasing, but when the star undergoes a supernova, I mean, I have turned off black hole kick uh, for this uh, in this system. Okay. So here it remains same. Um, and then you again get mass transfer, your separation changes. But uh, actually I asked a very good question. I forgot, but by this time you get this naked helium uh, secondary and this black hole primary star, the separation is almost something like 60 solar radii. In the final uh, part, it's due to the kick that uh, this neutron star gets when it's formed. The separation increases slightly to so, uh, 100 solar radii, but it is changing throughout the evolution. And most importantly, during these mass transfer phases, it's affected the most. Oh. Okay. So these time scales will also help us to understand that will they march within Hubble time scale, this black hole neutron star? Or yeah. Yeah, so I actually tested this. Uh, in uh, this case, it, they didn't merge. Their separation reduced. 
uh, but they didn't merge uh, within uh, 12 giga years of time. So if I evolve this system for 12 giga year, um, but yeah, I mean, um, other systems like this can, which initially we thought will get disrupted uh, with SAC, they can, um, I think they will be getting more mergers in that direction. I have a couple of questions. Uh, so how how does it work? So let's say that um, you you have some number of tracks pre computed, and let's yes. say that I want to change the uh, this alpha parameter that you uh, gave an example of. So do alpha I need, yes yeah uh, so do I need to uh, or do someone need to pre compute uh, all the scalar tracks using this particular alpha overshooting value and yes. then use material. Okay. Yes. So uh, for all the single star parameters, you will have to recompute the stellar models. Uh, but computing just so for uh, all this evolution, like um, the, the thing is, you only need certain set of tracks. So you don't have to evolve. Um, even if you're calculating uh, properties of a binary system of star, let's say you're calculating a property of a binary population where the lowest mass star you're considering is something like a 0.1 solar mass star and the maximum mass star you consider there is 100 or 120 uh, solar mass star. So something like a group IMF, mm. right? And um, so you will need something like, uh, in order to get good, so there's another thing that for interpolation to work uh, good, you need a dense, uh, uh, like densely, sorry, uh, dense grid. So you need to have, uh, but uh, separated in log. So for lower mass stars, you will need more stellar tracks. And for massive stars, you won't need that many stellar tracks. So uh, for massive stars, you will need some 15, 20 stellar models. And for low mass stars, let's just say you need some hundred stellar models. So again, hundred, um, honestly with Paul stack, I only have some 20 or 30 stellar models in all between 0.1 and uh, 50 solar masses. So you calculate these, whatever uh, certain, uh, let, let's just say we are only switching tracks for massive stars, we're only changing properties of massive stars. You calculate these 10, 20, or let's say 50 uh, models, which is not a big task. And because you can just run them in parallel, um, on a supercomputer or, or something, and then uh, need to you will need to convert them into EEP format. So you cannot directly use whatever one D code will give because um, if you if you run MISA or any other code, you will realize that um, the output is uh, it varies quite a lot in um, terms of time and everything, and it's also quite a lot. The files depending on again the resolution, um, the files can be pretty big. So you do not need that much data. So you, you need to reduce the size and convert it into EP format so Matisse can read it and then supply it there. So yes, you will have to, each time you change a physical parameter. So for example, uh, as I change alpha overshooting here, I had to compute it again, the whole set uh, with MISA. But once I have done that, I don't need to change it again and again, right? So um, if I want to test I can use the same set for testing this binary system. I can use the same set for testing a different binary system or a population of star, or I can just use it in star cluster simulation. But yeah, you will have to recompute uh, the stellar models if you are changing any physical parameter. Right. Um, so <clears throat> a related question is, so all the examples that you showed, the interpolation is done uh, between two different masses of stars. Um, uh, well, yes and no, but uh, go on. So I was wondering whether this interpolation scheme can also be extended to multiple dimensions. For example, you may have uh, a metallicity grid, you may have an alpha overshooting grid, you may have you know, hydrogen helium abundance grid. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, um, I must say. And uh, okay, so let me answer this. So just uh, in terms of interpolation, uh, the interpolation scheme that I use is um, a cubic spline. 
So you need four uh, stellar tracks to compute evolution of just uh, one star um, that's, that lies within these tracks. But um, on, like that changes on the boundaries. So uh, near the edges, you cannot get four tracks. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the four tracks should be that um, two tracks should, if I'm interpolating in mass, these two tracks should have initial masses greater than the initial mass that I want for my track and two uh, tracks which have initial masses less than uh, the mass I want for my track. So they should, the, 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 the track that is being interpolated should lie in between. But at the edges, you can't get there. So there I have to use linear interpolation. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a cubic span interpolation otherwise. And um, so you forgot your uh, next part. So uh, the question basically was, so in all of the examples that you showed, uh, yeah. it looks like uh, you, let's say that you have uh, some models for uh, stars that are between say 18 and 20 solar mass and some other models between 25 and 30 solar masses. And you want to know what's happening to a star that is say 22 solar mass, okay? Yes. So it's a interpolation between tracks that are lower mass and higher mass. Yes. I was wondering whether it's also possible to extend it to multiple dimensions. Let's say that you also have uh, pre-computed models in multiple metallicities yes. or alpha overshooting or whatnot. It is definitely possible to extend this in different dimensions. So, uh, but there is a caveat. Um, so you can, yeah, you can use it for uh, metallicity, rotation rates, different alpha overshooting parameters and, and like all these different values. But in order to get correct results, or to, okay, you can interpolate between anything, but you need to make sure that the output you are getting is same as or similar to what you would expect from a 1D code. So you can do that for metallicity and other things as well, but for that, you will need to know how these different, uh, these tracks, how do they vary with these parameters? So as I said, that if you're evolving, um, uh, different mass tracks. Just again, go back to that example. Uh, for lower mass stars, you will need uh, tracks uh, at every 0 0.1, 0 0.01 uh, difference in initial mass. So if to evolve a one solar mass track, I'll need uh, at least a 1.5, two solar mass or more closely spaced like 1.2, 1.4, those kind of stellar masses. But when I go to massive stars, I do not need this accuracy. I can evolve a 20 solar mass track from a okay, not 20, but um, 50 solar mass track very easily from a 40 and um, 60 solar mass uh, track, right? So it will depend on um, how these properties are varying. For example, if you want to interpolate in metallicity, tracks near solar metallicity or at high metallicities vary a lot. So there you will need a very dense grid of these stellar models, right? And then at lower metallicity, it again tails off, the differences aren't that much, so there you can use a densely um, uh, a sparsely uh, uh, populated grid. So yeah, I mean, you can, uh, you can definitely extend this to higher dimensions. And also, uh, since we're talking about this, I quickly um, would show one thing. So, so this um, um, particular HR diagram here shows how Métis tracks compare with the detail models. So this is again using Paul Settle 1998 tracks, and I have computed it for a few uh, stellar models. So one solar mass, 2.5, and up to 40 solar masses. And um, what I did in calculating each of these tracks with METIS, I removed the original track from the data set. So if the track is already there, METIS wouldn't interpolate, right? If it already has a one solar mass track, it, it already has it, right? It, it won't do any interpolation in mass. But when I remove this track, what you see here is the track that I got solely from the interpolation of nearby tracks. And similarly for other stars, I like removed each of these tracks one by one and then computed what METIS would give me. And you can clearly see that for lower mass stars, because it's a dense grid, it actually does a pretty good job. The interpolated track you get from METIS is quite similar to what you will get from detailed models. Again, a similar thing for a 2.5 solar mass star. But for a 10 solar mass star uh, here, I have to use, um, so there are different cutoffs in my interpolation range. I won't go into talking too much uh, in that detail, but let's just say 
that here I couldn't get whole neighboring tracks, so I had to use linear interpolation. And there you can see that agreement between what you will get from a detail code and what you get from interpolation is not very good, especially for blue loops, right? So you can definitely interpolate, but I think the question would be um, how much uh, these properties vary uh, with different stellar models and whether or not what you will get is is comparable to what you will get from the 1D code itself. If you were not using METIS, you were, if you were running that code uh, again. Of course. So that actually de also determines the density required for your pre-computed tracks. Yeah, in a way. So usually like a log, uh, uh, a grid uh, separated by log in mass is does good. Um, but yeah, I can't, I don't think I can say same for metallicity and also like so far it has been really difficult to get a good set of stellar models, uh, even for single metallicity. Uh, so yeah, I'm still, um, uh, looking into, um, and, and that's, that was one of the reasons why I compare different stellar models, because I just wanted to see that, okay, uh, can we get these, uh, I was just testing different models available out there. Uh, what for what values they're available for what values of metallicity and mass range but um, yeah instead I found this that if I just compare all of them there's like so much difference in the properties or the properties their models predict cool yeah so yeah I mean maybe like uh, at some point somebody can calculate a big grid of MISA models and then we can interpolate in metallicity as well Ambrish. Um, uh, hi, hi, Pujan. Hi. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk, first of all. Uh, I have a question that is kind of related to the previous discussion. Uh, right. uh, is there a prescription in METIS for extrapolation as well? So, or does, yes. does the, the stellar trend no. that you have set the limit for uh, how the upper and lower limit for the masses that you can uh, evolve? The answer to both questions is yes. Okay. And, um, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, in METIS, we do use extrapolation, but not on the, uh, the boundary of stellar tracks we have. So if let's, let's just, just say that um, I have a set of stellar tracks where the least massive models I have, model I have is one solar mass, and the most massive model I have is 40 solar masses. So in METIS, I wouldn't extrapolate beyond 40 solar mass stars if you give it a star which is like 41 solar masses, it will throw an error. It will say that I cannot um, interpolate. And similarly, if you give it a 0.9 solar mass uh, uh, star to interpolate, it will again throw error. But um, as I said that um, the thing is, um, so stars properties, they vary with stellar masses. And it so happens that there are certain phases in stars life, which happen for certain stars, but they do not occur beyond a stellar uh, mass. So I have the example right in front of me. So let's just consider this 10 and 20 solar mass track. They both have similar main sequence, main sequence hook. So this is where they will end uh, hydrogen burning. Uh, this star, this 10 solar mass star will expand on thermal time scale to become a red giant and then would undergo core helium burning in a loop and then finally um, uh, do this loopy part and would again evolve to carbon burning and so on, right? And again, if the mass loss rate is high enough, it would become, um, it will evolve uh, to higher temperatures. Otherwise it will just end its life here near Hayashi track. Now for a 20 solar mass star, story is very different. So, I mean, it's same until the main sequence bit, but after that, the husband gap part, uh, phase part here is very short because these stars, the cores are massive enough to um, have helium ignition pretty much immediately. So the, the star uh, starts burning, uh, starts having core helium burning somewhere here. And by the time it extends the red giant, you call, don't call it red giant band, you call it a super giant branch or just the giant branch here. It's, it's not the same as this one. It has very different uh, chemical, chemical properties. It might have, um, it might be burning uh, co uh, carbon in the core now. So for example, you cannot, there, is, there are no equivalent phases that we, uh, except for main sequence, mm -hmm. um, there are no equivalent phases in these stars. And if we interpolate between these two tracks, 
we would get this jump in uh, stellar properties. So there will be jump in luminosity and T-effective, but most importantly, there will be jump in other surface properties, so radius, um, chemical compositions, especially surface composition and so on. So uh, that's one problem that we cannot interpolate between such tracks. And that's why, um, so whenever I have, and there are like four or five such limits. So this is like the one most obvious one. Uh, so when that happens, I um, extrapolate downwards from the more massive track. So it, mm -hmm. usually it, it gives me okay results, but yeah, it's, it's something I try to avoid and only use extrapolation. That is like only when it's really, really necessary. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, the reason I asked the first question was because uh, if we are, if you are thinking about uh, incorporating this in st uh, stellar evolution code. Yeah. Uh, and if let's say you initially have a group of mass function and the maximum mass of 150 solar mass, there can be stellar mergers that can uh, create uh, stars of masses uh, more than that. So would that be a problem? Yes, that will be. But for that, uh, we'll be just come, we'll just have to include models of these very massive stars. Okay. Uh, the, the reason is, um, okay, I can extrapolate. But uh, extrapolation often ends up like, again, the same thing. I, I can extrapolate, but it won't give the right answer. So yeah. this is something like what happens in SSC. I mean, SSC fitting formulae have been only computed for stars up to 50 solar masses, right? Like the maximum uh, mass track they had in the set was just 50. Um, but then uh, people use it for very massive stars, thousands of solar mass. and they're outright wrong. The results that you get are incorrect. It's just extrapolating these formulas. You end up with getting all those weird negative radius thing because you're using those formulae beyond the domain they were intended to use. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, you can extrapolate here as well, but what's the point? You will be getting wrong answer. Yeah. Thanks, thank you very much. I think this is a very nice point to uh, stop today's discussion. Uh, let's thank uh, Pujan again. Um, so I, I think the, I really like uh, the last statement that uh, you know you you can keep on using a code um, that doesn't break, but what's the point if it gives wrong answer? I think we can end with that remark. Can I, can I ask one? Thank you, Pujan. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so I think somebody had a question. I, I don't know who said that, but yeah. uh, no more hands. Um, and in the hello, hello, yeah, hello, hello, yeah. Uh, so I want to ask that these limitations of the masses is coming from the back end model, which is used for interpolation. Like if we have some limitation in MESA model then mm -hmm. only we will be limited by this extrapolation or interpolation. No, and this I... is uh, no, this is what uh, like these kind of tracks you get even in like, this is not coming from uh, MISA. Like it's just, you will get it from pretty much any 1D stellar evolution code. Like this is just what we get from basic solving those stellar structure equation. Um, the size of this loop is something um, uh, not very definitive, like it changes with uh, quite semi-convection is one parameter I know affects this a lot. Also your resolution parameters. Uh, so yeah, it, like the exact detail you will get here would be different between different stellar evolution codes and what the phys what physical input you're using. But the, uh, the, this star will undergo, <coughs> sorry, um, undergo this Hussman gap phase and the red giant phase, that will happen in pretty much uh, any code that you use. And for example, the star won't undergo that phase. It will continuously uh, continue to burn on different um, elements in the code. That is again, you will get in every code. Okay. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Pujan. Very sort of. Thank you for um, uh, inviting me to give this talk. It was really great having all these wonderful interactions. I really enjoyed all the questions. I'm looking forward to you uh, 
coming here in person. Yeah, I, I will let you know. Uh, yeah, I, um, yeah, somewhere somewhere by September. But when, or as soon as I have some sort of concrete plan, um, yeah, I will let you know. Bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. You too.